Hello everybody. Variety is of great importance to me on this channel. And trust me, nobody is more aware than I of the need for a little bit of balance when I've done a week featuring V12 Ferraris, a week featuring 911s, and so on and so forth. If there is one lesson that I have learned in my driving career, both during and before YouTube, it's that there isn't really a direct connection between price and enjoyment. There are things about expensive cars that I really like, but in terms of cars that make me smile, and that, if you ask me, is what I think this channel is really about, there's absolutely nothing wrong with cheaper cars whatsoever. Yes, I am a Ferrari owner, but when the sun is shining, the keys I often gravitate towards will be those of my S2000. I cannot wait to get my Celica GT4 back at all. And when Callum got in touch with me, offering me his mini John Cooper Works for review, I leapt at the chance, because this is a car that I happen to know is fast, is fun, and more importantly, is affordable. In the interest of complete transparency, I will admit that the modern Mini, and in fairness, the Classic 2, is a car that I hate to love. But love it, I do. For years and years, I did nothing whatsoever but moan about these cars. My sister had one, and I thought it was simply an expensive alternative to a sensible car. I just didn't get it. The styling seemed all faux retro and nonsensey to me, and I just didn't understand the appeal of front-wheel drive cars or hatchbacks full stop. Curiously, as I've matured, it's these kind of cars that have started to grow in their appeal. Mainly the reason for that being that, as I'm lucky enough to have more than one car on the driveway, I no longer need a car that does everything. Although for many people, paradoxically, a small hatchback will be the one car that has to do everything. Now this is a 61 plate, so 2011 Mini John Cooper Works. I have reviewed a John Cooper Works previously. That was the R53, the first BMW Mini. The key difference between the two for most people is going to be the fact that that one was supercharged and this is turbocharged. The power figure isn't dramatically different, but the way that they sold the cars is. You see, with the first generation car, it was sold exclusively as a dealer fit kit. You couldn't buy a John Cooper Works, you had to buy a Cooper S and then fit the John Cooper Works tuning kit to it, which was actually quite a comprehensive little package. With this though, they did a bit of both, because early on they still offered the John Cooper Works tuning pack, but then they did these, the factory John Cooper Works. And you'll see people often talking about the car as being a factory car, which might seem obvious to the rest of us, but it's important to know, because that means that this car has always been this specification. As you may expect it, the John Cooper Works specification includes a raft of upgrades to just about everything. The brakes, the suspension, the engine, they're all mildly uprated. As standard, this car would then put out about 210 horsepower and around 200 pound foot of torque. I say around because by default it should put out a little bit less, but during heavy acceleration it's got a mild overboost function giving it just more than 200 pound foot. And that really should be enough to push about a 1200 kilo car down the road. This one isn't entirely standard, but the modifications are pretty subtle. It has an AEM induction kit. No performance gain that I know has been claimed for that. I'm sure it's got maybe a very minor one. And it also has Bilstein coilovers on it. There's some cosmetic modifications too. A little rear wing at the back that looks very similar to the GP2 item, but isn't from a GP. And the rear diffuser, which is from a GP. That means that at low speeds, it's quite a fidgety little so-and-so. And there are a few creaks and rattles in this cabin as well. I always felt like the later R56 cars were built just that much better than the earlier 53. It may well be that it's simply time which hasn't had enough of a chance to nibble away at the 56's interior. Yeah, if you're a BMW owner, even of say something like a, a 1 Series, like the 130i that I used to have, this isn't a high quality place. 
but if you compare it to many Fords or Vauxhalls of the period and of the price, actually it's pretty good. It still has this sort of faux retro thing going on, but it's a, a little bit more modern. Cars like this one, which have got some decent spec on them, have a little screen here, and to those that have had a BMW from a few years ago, it'll be pretty familiar. A performance Mini has pretty much one purpose in life, as far as I'm concerned, and it's to get you down this exact road, or something much like it, with a huge grin on your face. So does it? Let's find out. Unlike the supercharged car, it has a lot of torque. I was always surprised at how much you really needed to rev the R53 out to get the best from it. And that one had a great little soundtrack, that supercharger whine and that four-cylinder engine working away was quite intoxicating. This one, even with the catback exhaust that it also has on it, doesn't sound particularly inspiring, but it's got ample shove from essentially nothing, and it is really big fun. The steering's great, got a little bit of texture to it, great weighting though, and this car is darty. It's a word I use a lot, but this does personify it. I don't subscribe to the notion that minis handle like a go-kart because anybody that's ever been remotely close to a go-kart will have noticed the fact that they have the engine in the back. And go-karts have very unusual handling characteristics which I really would never ever like to have in a road car. But this is certainly a lot of fun. You can do whatever you want with it. It's a great size for this kind of road. Oh, it's so agile though, it just loves jumping into the corners. The last R56 that I drove was the Club Van, which had a very modestly remapped 1.6 diesel. This is the 1.6 petrol, and it's an item that was shared with many Peugeots, Citroëns, the 207 GTI, the RCZ as well I think, and if you want to breathe on it you can get some pretty impressive power out of it. Unfortunately, it isn't unburstable, and this car is currently chucking out the odd bit of smoke, or so I'm told I haven't seen it, which may be down to valve stem seals, a known weakness, and fortunately something that's not too expensive to put right. I am no expert on minis, but the running costs of one of these are not going to be too bad. It's a small, popular performance hatch. The biggest concern I'd have when buying any car like this would be simply who's owned it previously. So I'd be looking for all the usual stuff. Has it got a good history? Has it been looked after by the right people at the right intervals? And so on and so forth. That is gonna be key to finding a good car. The great news is of course with any popular car like this is that there are loads to choose from and there's absolutely no need whatsoever to go and buy a bad one. I did a quick little search online yesterday and there are heaps of these available from about 5,000 pounds going up to sort of about 10 to 12 really, I guess a little bit more if you want to pay it, for the really, really good ones. The weighting of the other controls in here is pretty decent too. The gearbox has a short throw, just the right amount of notchiness, and it's a real joy to use. It's a six speed item too, which is pretty nice, and may well be an upgrade for a lot of people looking at buying a car like this. The clutch is easy to use, the brakes actually are exceptional, they've got a really nice action to the pedal. You don't need a lot of force to actuate them, but they're really progressive, nicely linear, which means that you can modulate it, which is important because when the conditions are a little bit mixed, as you can probably tell it's raining now, you want to have absolute control of that front end. The car pulls from about two and a half and seems to deliver its best work from about three, giving you a pretty decent power band as well. The engine will rev to about six and a half. Really you can change by about five or five and a half and still be making pretty swift progress. For a road like this, it's got all the performance you'd ever need to have fun. That is the key thing. Now, some downsides of the little Mini. It is hopefully not going to be too expensive to run, but as you've probably guessed already, they aren't bulletproof. The engines do have a few known issues, which is problematic. 
Parts for these are also probably going to be a little bit more than they would be for, say, the equivalent Peugeot, Citroën or whatever. But there is enough of an aftermarket out there that I don't think anything's going to be particularly ruinous. There's also a number of these that I'm sure have found hedges, so breakers yards will hopefully still have a decent supply of them. The space available to you in the back seat of a modern Mini has always seemed surprisingly generous, even in the regular hatch. But unfortunately, they've achieved that by taking it away from the boot, which is very stingy indeed. They claim it's more than the outgoing model, and I'm sure it is, but it's still not an awful lot. Unfortunately, while there are larger Minis that you can buy, I really, really don't see the point in any of those. And if you need a little Super Mini with a bit more space than this, you probably should just go and buy a Fiesta or something like that. The Bilstein coilovers fitted to this car I thought would have ruined proceedings a bit more than they actually have. Yes, it's a choppy and bouncy ride, particularly at a low speed on these kind of bouncy little B roads, but this is kind of a car designed for younger people and I remember tolerating an awful lot that I wouldn't now when I was a younger gentleman. If you're an older buyer looking to purchase one of these, I'd stick with the standard suspension or perhaps even avoid the John Cooper works altogether. There will of course be adjustable aftermarket suspension options which mean that you can then set it up however you like. But you've got to remember, this is a fairly lightweight car with a pretty short wheelbase, so physics at some point is going to intervene and tell you that you cannot make this ride like an S-Class. Just not going to happen. Insurance on these cars is also not the cheapest, especially if you do intend to modify them. Uh, this car's owner is still a fairly young chap, but he has eight years of no claims bonus, and still this car cost him nearly a thousand pounds to insure. That's quite a bit. As an old geezer with a trade policy now, I'm sort of out of touch with insurance prices, but it seems like an awful lot. That was, to give you some context, more than I was paying for my Lotus Evora when I had that. And that was a brand new sports car, costing a fair amount of money with double the power of this. That is unfortunately what happens when you do have popular performance cars, because they do find the hedgerows a little bit more frequently than the insurance companies would like. And they do like to play the numbers game actually pretty refined in here as well which means that you could do longer journeys especially if you're on slightly smoother motorway tarmac this car even has the Harman Kardon stereo system in it and it's actually pretty roomy in the front seats as well visibility is really quite good you can even see a little bit of that bonnet up front in fact, in every direction you can see what you need to see, which means for younger drivers, perhaps not the John Cooper Works, but the regular Mini 1 or Mini First or whatever the hell they call them, it's probably a good choice because there's no excuse. You did see that bus coming. This car is fitted with a sport button, which is cleverly hidden behind the gear lever down here. I normally don't like sport buttons and this car's owner has assured me that it's well worth pressing. Personally, I don't believe it. But gonna find out anyway. Yes, it, it does what sport mode in all BMWs do. It just ruins the throttle pedal and turns it into a switch. But this is the kind of road that this car should absolutely dominate. Let's have some fun. Ordinarily, I'm not a fan of turbocharged engines, but somehow this one does suit the character of this car. Because the car isn't hugely powerful, there's no real issue with the turbo lag. It's still there, but it's not something that I'm actually worried about. It does turn you into something of a hooligan. No wonder the insurance prices for these things are so high. The steering wheel is uh, nice to hold, but it's this weird mixture of leather and Alcantara, and the Alcantara unsurprisingly has completely fallen apart. The seats are actually all right. They don't look the most supportive, but they hold you in place well enough, even for a chunkster like myself. 
sure, I might be tempted to put some buckets or something in here, but then you will lose the use of the back seats entirely. And by the time you're going to do that, you should be asking yourself whether maybe you should have just bought the GP instead. Of course, you're going to spend a lot more money for the GP, which does then create an interesting dilemma. Do you buy one of those or do you build your own? And that's the joy of cars like this. Customization, personalization. You know what? I love the way this car goes. I love the way that it looks. I enjoy steering it. All the controls are nicely weighted. Yeah, it's a bit too bouncy for my liking, but the trade-off is it's a total riot on a back road. It's not obnoxiously loud, actually. Very impressed at that. Really nicely judged. I hate myself for saying it, but I really like this car. There it is. Thank you all for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.